All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. You've reached the internet's home for all things masonry. Join On The Level Podcast as we plumb the depths of our ancient craft and try to unlock the mysteries, dispel the fallacies, and utilize the teachings of Freemasonry to unlock the greatness within each of us. I have you now. Save your clapping to later, folks. Ah, welcome to On the Level Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Burns. And today we have a very special guest to me on the show with us. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> uh, this is Worshipful David Finkelstein, who is Worshipful Master of Liberty Lodge number 412, the only Daylight Lodge in the 23rd and Sonic District of Florida. Welcome to the show, Brother Finkelstein. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. I really loved your show. I think it's um uh, something very special, uh, something that we could have used a long time ago. But of course, we didn't have you a long time ago. We probably would have. But thanks well, you, for you know me. what? Here's the thing. I was thinking about this this morning because I asked you to come on like a week ago or something, and we kind of been planning it. I was thinking, you know, um, people might not know who David Finkelstein is. This podcast obviously wouldn't exist without you. Um, I wouldn't be a Mason today if it wasn't for you. Uh, you literally saved me from leaving the fraternity at a, at a low point for me when I was very early on um, and did a lot of advisement for me. And you introduced me to a really core group of people that changed my life, uh, like worshipful Ramon Hernandez Rond. Uh, uh, you kind of made those introductions for me. Um, and you guys really did formulate my thoughts about the fraternity and like reinforced my belief that it's a good thing and that I should not let it go so quickly uh, out of my own ignorance, really, which was the case at the time. So um, that being said, you know, yes, you're a past master of the lodge and yes, you're, you've been a committee man for many years and, you know, yes, you've done tons of Scottish Rite degrees, some of the hardest parts and some of the toughest degrees, yes. You've done lectures in probably nine lodges or more. Um, I saw you do uh, two lectures back to back, two different lectures in two different lodges on two different days consecutively. So I'm aware that you have a, a pretty uh, hefty Masonic credentials behind you. Um, a lot of people probably don't know that about you. Uh, because the, this younger generation, they just don't ask questions. And they don't know about the generation that came before them. Uh, not to make you feel old, because generations in Freemasonry are not like generations in life. <laughs> a generation in Freemasonry is like an officer line, which is like five years, basically. And then after five years, you got a whole new generation of people that don't even know what happened before them, generally speaking. So, uh, first of all, thank you for everything that you've done for me and uh, that you've done for the fraternity. I, I watched you do a lot of charitable things in silence um, and never took credit for it. And uh, like me, you aren't afraid to ruffle some feathers when you feel very passionately about things. And people probably know you more for that than the things you <laughs> silently did that were positive and good for people. <laughs> and that is, uh, you know, kind of like, I'm talking my ass off. I'm going to let you talk in a second. But I think that's like indicative of people that uh, don't have a massive ego that they are fine with being known for the, the fights that they fought instead of the good works that they did. Uh, but would you, would you agree or disagree that you're semi uh, demigod? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was about to say that I will stipulate to the historical timeline, but the rest of it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, no. But thank you for saying that anyway. I appreciate that. I um, There was a, um, Lyndon Johnson has something funny to say about that. He said, so that's that's a, a great introduction, the best introduction I ever heard. Actually, the second best introduction I ever heard. The first was when the master of ceremonies got stuck in traffic and I had to introduce myself. <laughs> you think you could have done a better job? I Actually, no. You Actually, no. <laughs> I don't even remember some of that stuff. Um, but that's kind of saying now. Um, 
you, um, I that took me a long time. I've been in masonry 15 years and it took me a long time to figure things out. And you uh, knew it intuitively and have had a tremendous influence with the, um, let's not hurt yeah. our arms, patting each other on the back, but the, uh, the um, membership drive that you have, I don't know how many people have heard of that, but um, you uh, advertise, I don't know how you do it, I'm not in marketing, but bring in people in droves. I mean, we were having 10 and 10 and 12 um, yeah. besides classroom, I mean, classes, and um, it was really yeah. impressive. Well, it's like I I wasn't a part of as many groups as you were before I joined the fraternity. So my ignorance probably helped me in some ways. Uh, you, I know you guys, like you talked about the Rotary Club and you talked about other groups you were a part of yeah. that um, I didn't even know about or, you know, wasn't around. So maybe I just out of ignorance got, you know, I wasn't burdened with like previous experience in organizations really. Yeah. So I didn't know what was allowed or wasn't allowed. I didn't know what people liked and didn't like. I just did what was natural to me, which got me in a lot of trouble, obviously, but it also helped a lot of people. It's kind of the dichotomy of humanism, you know? Great things come attached to human people. Yeah. Yeah. And human people do dumb things and say dumb things all the time. And that's kind of one of the things we, we want to talk about today, which is brotherly love, keeping our passions within due bounds, these kind of basic tenets of Freemasonry that are really brought to us in the very beginning of our journey in Freemasonry, right? We talk about them in the lectures and our entered apprentice degrees and then in the education we get afterwards and mentoring. So for months, we're thinking about this stuff when we first join. Um, and then we're on to the next thing. And I don't know how many people really realize how important these things are to keep coming back to so that you don't lose sight of what's really important. Yeah, I, and, <clears throat> that's a big thing of mine, too. I think that um, that we should go slowly through each degree because uh, there's a lot there and you're supposed yeah. to feel that, you know, that degree when you're an independent, you're supposed to be humble, uh, yes. deferential to uh to me <laughs> to us uh, <laughs> to people that are older and um it, it's good to be in there for a while and feel that and then move on to the fellow craft and you know feel that step up and then the step up to yeah. uh, master mason where you can just be that's me yeah, um, the big data. some people go through it too fast in my in my opinion one it of the does, things it feels things that we, because... I, I'm sorry go ahead well, in the state of Florida, in our jurisdiction. Oh, wow. That was an accidental cheer. I apologize for that. Uh, there was <laughs> no right. in it. Okay. Um, we are only giving these people six months to go through the, each of the three degrees, like six months in between degrees. Mm-hmm. And if they take any longer, we force them to come back into the lodge and get re-voted on as members, which mm-hmm. is a little bit scary. So I think there's always that fear of like, I don't want to go too close to six months because I don't want to have that whole ordeal of getting brought up for like now the whole lodge knows I'm taking too long or that, you know, something's not right with me. And so I think that kind of like deadline really drives people to go too fast. Sometimes you're right. You know, I didn't even know that. Um, They say when you teach a class or participate in something, you always learn something. I didn't know that. So I, I take back everything I said. (laughs) <laughs> no, they, but that's the truth because I've had classes that took over six months and they mm-hmm. get, you got to go back in front of the lodge and ask the craft to allow you to continue to do your work. And it's wow. kind of like, it's not a big deal. It shouldn't be a big deal, but you know how it is. We're talking about people. So people yeah. make it a big deal. They start like wondering what's going on there. Is the catechism guy not doing his job? Are the students, are they, are they thick headed lunks? Like what's going on with these people? So everybody has a fear of like, I got to get it done. I got to get it done. And that that, that's, that's as much for the catechism instructor as the students. I think that they feel like it's a reflection on them as to how quickly they can get their class through. Yeah. Yeah. Now I had a thought. You know, that's do, you, do you mind me throwing in random thoughts? Cause that's the way I run my life. <laughs> I love when it. I random, when a random thought. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the catechism, 
I decided that, you know, back, I decided, I speculated that back in the Middle Ages, uh, if you had a one word um, password, somebody might guess it, overhear it. Um, and, you know, that meant death during the Inquisition. So I was thinking maybe that whole catechism is a one long password because that would be hard to um, overhear and replicate. So that's, I have no citation for that. Uh, other that's an than, interesting thought. And me just speculating. So, but if it was important, they would have they wouldn't have written it down, or everybody would have learned it. So, you can't you can't also say it's not true. What you're what you're suggesting there might be true. But you know, right before I got before I came in back in 1492, um, they had been there was no red book. They had been doing it mouth to ear the whole the whole the whole um, catechisms. All the I hear a lot of guys say that they prefer that. Yeah, that they prefer that. Um, I guess I can understand it. Um, in in the modern world, it's a little difficult to get because we were doing such big classes. Like you said, we we did have a ten person class more than once, yeah. and uh, we try to get eleven guys to show up at the same spot every week on time yeah. and pay attention is like freaking monumental in this day and age. Yeah. So it can be so difficult to do it mouth to ear like that, which is, I guess, why they came up with this this book, which in Florida looks like this, and it basically codes everything. So you have like a sort of reference point. You can kind of go home and study on your own. Yeah. If you know, if you can decipher the code at least. Um, I and, you know, I use that a lot because as like you, um, I have a gold card, and that means you have to memorize essentially everything that's in this book. And show somebody that you know it. And um, I bothered you like I, I I know you were getting annoyed with me because I was constantly trying to get words and have you listen to me and tell me if I'm right. And other people that I was calling up at the time, I tried not to annoy one person too much. So I'd have three people I'd call for different things so that no one got really mad at me. Uh, but that's what it is when it's mouth to ear. You, you literally are depending on other people to get education. You know, that's, Which is you, that's a, um, <laughs> the uh, that that can roll us back back around to brotherhood because I didn't for a minute uh, feel imposed upon uh, by you or anybody else that was learning it. Uh, number one is because that's how I learned it. I had to call people. Uh, number two is uh, brotherhood means it's a relationship. That means that uh, we we. It, I think it's a symbol for the relationship we have. You know, brothers uh, have a close relationship. Some of them, some of them, <laughs> not so much. Yeah. But the, you know, the assumption is that brothers have a, 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 yeah. a close relationship. So brotherhood is a symbol for our relationship. We're not really brothers, but we call right. each other brothers. But brother yeah. is a symbol. So um, one of one way to look at all this is if you look for opportunities to display brotherhood and yeah. when you call um it's an opportunity um in um yeah and yeah uh, in you're absolutely right that is a very good point like and it's something like you're new right when you're trying to learn this stuff and you're applying the outward rules or what we call the profane society's rules onto the fraternal ones mm -hmm. so i'm like oh i must be annoying this guy but I didn't even, you know, think Masonically that you would be, as the person getting the phone call, feel like, oh, now I have an opportunity to show my lodge and everybody else how much I care about the fraternity by giving my time to this person who needs it. It's like an opportunity to show your love. And uh, you're always waiting for that opportunity. Because yeah. you can really only truly show love through your actions, right? Words are cheap. Yeah, or... Sometimes you can whistle, you know, not nah, strike that, strike that. Uh, I'm a pretty girl, but strike that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now there's some some religions that um, where when somebody asks you for help, you thank them, and after you do something for somebody, you thank them because they gave you the opportunity to commit a good uh, commit um, to engage in a in a um, in a good deed. Um, so kind of like in that sense, you're showing God how much you love your God by doing something good for another human that you didn't have to do. Yeah, that may be in some religions. The ones I'm thinking about, though, are just that um, 
you um you know the world is uh, one of them is the world is a, is a, a a vessel and God came in there and smashed the vessel and the pieces are everywhere and you're supposed to put them back and that when you do a good deed you put back uh, one of the parts of the vessel so you and that's a great good deed to do that and so a person that needs um needs some help the um and they ask you they're doing you um you, they're doing you a good deed by letting you do them a good deed so well um, do you mind if i if i actually read what freemasonry says to the entered apprentice about brotherly love specifically yeah, that'd be great. Brotherhood? Mm -hmm. as you know in the entered apprentice lecture there's a section where we talk about brotherly love and we explain it to the new initiate and don't worry masons it's it's not coded it's written out don't call and write letters and try to get <laughs> grandmaster to remove me there's better things to do that about this is written out and we're allowed to talk about it <laughs> um by the exercise of brotherly love we are taught to regard the whole human race as one family so now it's going beyond just my friend in freemasonry they're saying brotherly love as a mason means you love every living person as a family member right yeah yeah the high the low the rich and the poor who being created by one almighty parent and inhabitants of the same planet <laughs> ought to aid support and protect each other i always laugh when i say that part in the in the lecture because it, it makes it almost ridiculous how we don't treat each other properly you know like we're yeah. inhabitants of we have the same almighty parents, whether you're born in Istanbul or Florida. Uh, we are, we share the same parentage and we're living here on the same planet. We have to share the same air, resources, water. We should support and protect each other. We shouldn't divide and, and fight each other. Yeah. On this principle, masonry unites men of every country, sect, and opinion and conciliates true friendship among those who might otherwise have remained. <laughs> at a perpetual distance that's what we tell in our apprentices about brotherly love and what masonry means when they talk about brotherly love and it's so true right like you and yeah. i only met because of the fraternity yeah yeah and we've had a very close friendship that spanned uh seven years or something now it's been seven years um, really wow you've you've been in my home for thanksgiving one year we had thanksgiving mm -hmm. dinner together uh our families and i've been you know we've been with you through some challenges you've had in the hospitals and stuff yeah. you know yeah. i've come to you for advice over the years and you give me counsel that i sometimes listen to and to your chagrin sometimes don't listen to <laughs> but i always appreciate it uh and yeah. th that's a relationship in my life that's really important to me and we've also had our differences this is really important i think to share we've had yeah. big blow fights over the years but one of us calls the other the next day and says, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, it doesn't matter what happens. I'm always going to love you. You're my brother. Right. I, you can never say anything bad enough to me that the next day I'm not going to be like, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Like, yeah, you told yeah. me that once you said, um, you know, I'll always be a friend no matter what happens. That's, you know, that's there. I might get mad at you. I may, um, you know, have to turn you in and put you in jail. You didn't say that part, but I'm still, I'm always going to love you. And that's, that meant a lot. I would do it. And I, I would come visit you in jail. Yeah. <laughs> right. Makes a big, makes a big difference. Um, Bring me some cigarettes and other currencies that would make your life easier. <laughs> that's right. Now you've said something that I was going to remark on. Um, can't remember. I'm getting old. Um, well, one How of the old things. Are you now? 68. Can you believe that? 68. I don't, I don't, oh, I do look 68. <laughs> okay. I'll keep the hat on. Um, and in, in your home life, you're a lawyer? Is that your profession? I, I'll admit to that. And and you were a CPA in a former life. Well, yeah, well, I, 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 um, I didn't really practice CPA, but two years so I could get my entered apprentice. <laughs> they have a, an apprenticeship in CPAs, uh, with CPA, so I, I did that for um, two years. And then um, I, I uh, became a lawyer because that's what I'd always wanted to be was, was a lawyer. You always wanted to be a lawyer? Yeah. And you just like arguing or was it about helping people? What was the drive there? Um, it was kind of a weird drive for a little kid. But um, I said, 
you know, I asked my cousin, you know, um, where, where do, I, I like science. I said, where, where do astronomers work? And they said, well, they work at universities and things like that. And I said, well, who are they? Um, I said, so do they all do that? And they said, yeah, yeah, they have to. And I thought, well, I don't want to work for the government because they may cut back my funding. <laughs> and I was like 12 or 10. And I said, I'm going to stay away from that. And most sciences work for some big organization. And a lot of them, the government or funded by government. And so I said, forget yeah. that. So I thought I'd be a, an independent person and be a lawyer. And the irony of that is your daughter worked for the government. <laughs> that's right that's right and she still got it. one of you but she's she's a lot more mellow you know they were going to cut off funding she was going to not get paid and she just said oh well i'll walk dogs or something and so um, <laughs> she's a lot more yeah mellow than me. it's true you know if the government cuts you off you just go work for a private company and lobby the government there's always money around the government one way or the other yeah and I learned a lot. One thing is, I mean, we're getting far afield. You know, I'm not even going into that. All right. No. So All right. let's well, talk a little bit more about brotherhood. Well, so you, I'm going to give you one example. I have many where, um, where, um, what's your name? Chris bailed me out. Um, yeah. I, I was uh, working really hard and wasn't sleeping much. And I put together a, um, a uh, talk on uh, mental health. And so I went to the talk, wasn't feeling all that great, um, feeling tired. And I introduced the speaker, sat down and promptly fell out, just yeah. passed out. You were and, passed out. And, you know, everybody apparently was, you know, oh gosh, what happened? And fortunately, we have a medic named yeah. Robert Leonard, who's currently the Worshipful yeah. Master of uh, Liberty Lodge, great guy. Um, yes. And he checked me out and he said, he's fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> he's just asleep. So um, uh, Chris and Scott Wren came and got me and took me home and made sure I was, um, I don't know what you did. I was, I was out of it. Was, was my wife there? Did you tell her what happened? She wasn't there. So what did you do? You, you just shoved me in the door or what did you do? Well, actually, we put you on the couch. Um, mm. Scott wasn't there. It was just me. And, mm. uh, so I, you were able to walk, but not really well. And, uh, I put you on the couch and you were adamant that you had just, uh, forgotten that you had take your medication and you took your medication twice and you said you just needed to sleep it off. So <laughs> I left you there on your couch and I got a call from you 12 hours later telling me you just woke up. <laughs> That's funny. I don't remember that. Apparently, you yeah. slept on the couch for 12 hours after I dropped you off. That's great. That's great. Apparently, I needed it. Um, well, yeah, you know, that's you another good it. thing about masonry. It can help you with the sleep. You know, if you're in the lodge and they start reading the minutes, you know, you can catch up on your sleep. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. The minutes will put you right to sleep. <laughs> yeah. and But no, you're required to. And there's a lot of good reasons. You know, we want to make sure everything's written down right. Um so, um, well, actually, uh, this is probably the only time I'll ever see it, but, uh, there was a similar situation to the one you just described, but I wasn't at the place you were, I was summoned to you because you needed help. And, uh, when I arrived, you were sitting outside on the bench and, and, uh, you were in distress and it's the only time probably I'm ever going to see the actual grand hailing sign of distress used, um, hmm. because you gave it. And you were in distress and you needed, you weren't able to articulate that, but mm. you were, you were conscious enough to know that there was a way you could get help and Mason's listening. will know what I'm talking about. Wow. He did express it and he did receive it and it worked the way it's supposed to work. Wow. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. That's, that's, that's pretty neat. You know, there's lots of things we find as masonry goes on, but that's gotta be the most impressive to me. That's, that's um I had forgotten about that and thank you for reminding me about that and I, I appreciate it I really do um, this guy oh, come on. a great all, that, and that's how we are I always say that masonry is giving us like training wheels for life and so <laughs> we're able to have these close caring relationships with people that are masons because they're our brother what Freemasonry tells us we're supposed to treat the whole world this way 
even people we don't know, even people we don't like, even people that are different than us or richer than us or, or poorer than us. We're supposed to treat them with the same path, compassion. And so um, I've always found it a great challenge to try to take these lessons that we reaffirm all the time in lodges and take them out into the world and try to practice it with people that aren't close to us that we don't know. Um, try to show that same love for them. And that can be a challenge in today's world, yeah. which is not really used to that kind of behavior amongst well, people. You know, what you said is actually one of the purposes of masonry. And some people tell you it is the purpose of masonry to have you become a better person and then send you out into the, uh, into the profane world. Um, that's a funny, that's a funny, um, um, word to me it makes makes me think of people walking around cussing or something i but thought it anyway. was a derogatory word yeah the first time i heard it i thought that's a really derogatory way to talk about people yeah yeah but anyway but we're supposed to basically supposed to, i'm sorry go ahead a lot of words that like are in the fraternity are old words that had different meanings when they were used yeah. and now have been kind of like you know slangified and mean something a little different like to us, you said profane. It's true. When I heard it, I thought, oh, this, why do they call us like that? Like, not everybody's <laughs> profane. You know, I'll go around F this, F that. But when mm. I Googled it, profane meant something else mm. in old Let's English. Mm, like commonplace uh, or something? Yeah, something just like not, not of or not having the knowledge of or just being outside of enlightenment kind of. It didn't mean like a derogatory thing like we take it to mean. Same with worshipful. There when Americans hear worshipful, they're like, yeah. oh, this isn't good. I don't want to worship anybody. But <laughs> uh, that's not what it means. Heck, in England, they still call judges worshipful, right? I yeah, think. Sure do. Mm -hmm. So it has just totally different meaning. And uh, you're one of the people that tries to try to squash that pretty quick. Uh, <laughs> I know when you meet with new entered apprentices, that's like one of the first things you're tackling is I know what you're all thinking. Worshipful doesn't mean we're going to get down and worship this guy, okay? And then you start to explain what it means so that they have a, a better, like, uh, understanding of the concept of these teachings. And don't and run the, wild with your imagination. <laughs> one of the things I tell them is, you know, I was a worshipful, and people certainly didn't didn't worship me. They were, like, the opposite. Um, <laughs> well, not the opposite, but they, did, they didn't uh, bow and do, uh, and do my bidding. Um, the um, I guess you could have ordered them to. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, w I could have ordered them. I could have ordered a, a pony, and I wouldn't have gotten <laughs> yeah. uh, either one of them. That's one of my favorite sayings when somebody says, uh, "I want to do this," I go, "Yeah, and I want a pony." Um, kind of the equivalent of when Doctor Pill says, "How's that working for you?" How, how's that working for you? Yeah. Well, but that you know that part of the the statement of brotherly love, which is that we um. We need people that through the fraternity, we definitely never would have associated with without the fraternity. Yeah, that's true. And it is one of the great things of joining our fraternity is that you will mingle with people that you wouldn't normally mingle with and, and develop really close relationships with them, which is good for you as a person. It's yeah, good it's for you to get out you. your little circle. Yeah, it really is. Um, we need that and we don't have yeah. it in this world. We used to... <clears throat> I'm going to go into the, you, you've heard all of these, um, these are subjective lectures and, uh, and mentoring, um, mentoring talks. Um, one is that, um, I was listening. I, ne I never actually read the book. Yeah, I did go back and read the book, but there was a guy talking about a book he had written and he said that people need to be in tribes. That's, mm. um, the way we evolved or the way God made us. And in today's, ever since the car was invented, the beginning of the last century, People don't live in tribes anymore. Um, Neil Young has a, a, a saying about, I mean, in a line, he a line in a song talking about, you know, Native Americans. And he says that, you know, that he used to roam the plain and now he lives uh, in his little box at the top of the stairs by himself. And um, that's not helpful. And no matter where you are, you'll make a, you know, group of people will turn it into a tribe. Um, yeah. A block, you know, in big cities like New York City, there's a block, and you don't do certain things on somebody else's block, and you're gone. At a certain <laughs> time. And yeah. um, uh, my well, uh, the, mo the modernization of that, if you think about it, is made it 
more dangerous because it, it used to be, like you said, a block, like a geography thing, right? Like where you live yeah. was kind of going to be your tribe. You didn't have much say in it. That, that's just the way it was. Yeah. But now with the advent of the internet, people are making their tribes with people they may never meet all over the world. And they're wearing their hats and their little patches and they go out and they maybe even protest locally. And the people around them are like, who are you? What are you doing? But they feel like they're part of something and they feel like they found a tribe that understands them and accepts yeah. them. And the internet's made it so different than it ever, ever was meant for us as like a species and evolution, you know? Where it's, it is a physical geography thing where you're probably going to grow up around people and live with them and have to deal with them. Um, and your neighboring block or tribe might not feel the same way and you might fight with them and war with them. Mm -hmm. um, here on the internet, it's like, you know, they can find a tribe of people that are in Germany in from Florida and or, or uh, you know, you, you hear about people being radicalized into terrorism in the United yeah. States through the internet and it's crazy how dangerous it can be um because you know i think the internet doesn't do a good job of identifying truth from false um yeah. it kind of makes all information subjective like people can just choose what the truth is now <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think that's a really really dangerous thing for us as a people to get away from because we, we we do need tribes I mean, we are wired to be with other people, yeah. to feel satisfied and part of something. Um, and people are always going to seek that out. But the internet always kind of distills things to the lowest common denominator. So when you go on the internet looking for your tribe, even if it starts cosplaying as something innocent, it's going to eventually get to a dark place where you may not even know it, but you're potentially being radicalized into some crazy yeah. religion or cult i don't i'm not really in any tribes on the internet um but um you you're, you're 68 you said right 66 what's that you're 60 yeah. 66 tribes 66 um, so like when the internet came about you were already a grown man yeah mm -hmm. so you had Very lived a so. life and form mm -hmm. relationships and you knew what that meant. So why would good someone point. like that go seeking that out on the internet? It doesn't make Very sense. To you. Very good point. Yeah. Um, but these kids think... who grew up with nothing but the internet, they don't know about the childhood you had, you know, mm -hmm. where you got, you had to go play with people, <laughs> you had to work with people. Sometimes yeah. they were scary and that you didn't like, and you had to learn how to deal with that. They don't, they don't have that life today. It's crazy. That's a good point. You can just disconnect. Also, everybody pumps up what they're doing. So you're not interacting with the actual person. You're yeah. interacting with a, a fictional uh, yeah. version of that person. It's yeah. like you curate only the highlights of someone's life and put it out there. And people yeah. see that as the reality of a life when it's a curated, like specialized highlight reel of a life. It's not really that person's life. Yeah. Uh, that information isn't getting to the children they're believing stuff that they see online is real is that is that the way the world is just going to be from now on i think so i don't really? see how you i don't see how you take the fire out once you give it to people mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. once prometheus brought it to us he was like in big trouble because he can't take it back you know, I, so, I knew Prometheus. I'm, I'm very old. I knew Prometheus. He was a nice guy. <laughs> I didn't know you were Greek. Was he Greek or Roman? Um, he was uh, a Roman. Yeah, they had Greek the guy? same. They had the same people, but they just gave them new names, like Zeus and Jupiter were the same person. Um, is Christianity and Catholicism used like kind of the same? Generally, Catholics are just Christian, right? When you talk about yeah. Christians in yeah. Ireland. They're, they're the first Christians in the most, um, I guess you would say most orthodox, or one of the most orthodox. Um, well, they came from the Roman Catholic Church, which is where Christianity originated, I guess, probably, right? Um, no, that's where um, it spread a lot then, but Christianity had been a while, around for a while, and the Romans persecuted Christians uh, for a long time. And then one of the, um, I can't remember one, everybody else probably knows it, one of the uh, emperors decided, you know, 
he, he looked at Christianity and he says, yes, that's the truth. And he yeah. uh, said that, um, to um, all, the, all the Romans. And then, you know, the Romans were wandering around, you know, and um, to the countries and, and uh, take them over. And so they brought um, their religion with them. I think that's how it happened. I think they were still wandering around at that point. Um, yeah, but, and everything they saw was theirs, right? Hey, hey, there's some land. That's ours, too. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. That's nice. That's ours, too. Yeah. That's, that brings up the word superfluity because it, it, they didn't need it. It was unnecessary, and it was tacky that they would want it, but they went and got it anyway, kind of like um, hoarders that you hear, hear about where they've got 16 cats, you know, 15 or 14 of them are superfluous. Um, and so um, I wanted to, I was going to talk about that word too, and that was a good segue into it. Um, so let me tell you my um, experience with the word superfluity. Sure. Um, there are so many great unknown people in our fraternity. Um, before I even joined the fraternity, before I was an editor apprentice, I was uh, going to Phoenix Lodge number 346 is where I was going to be initiated in Sarasota. And mm -hmm. there was a gentleman there named Albert Dahl. Yeah, very yeah. similar to you. He was holding these like Masonic groups where you would just get together and talk about Masonic stuff. And yeah. I got invited to one before I was even in an apprentice. And it wasn't I didn't know what was going on or what to expect. He handed out playing cards to everybody around the round table and <laughs> said, I, I want everyone one at a time to flip over your card. And I've written some words there. And I want you to tell me the first things that come to your mind when you cool. see them. And, wow. uh, you know, my word was wisdom, so I didn't have a whole lot of Masonic <laughs> experience to draw, like say what this means. Uh, uh, so the first thing that came to my mind with wisdom was, oh, it's the accumulation of mistakes. Like, you know, that's what I think of was wisdom. And you, you, people think a wise man uh, never made a mistake. No, he made the most mistakes, the wise guy. He's done yeah. all of the things. But um, uh, another guy next to me got superfluity. Now, I never mm. heard the word superfluity. I thought it was a made-up word. Mm. And um, they started to talk about, to them, what came up when that word was said. And they were very Masonic things they were saying. But as, as a non-Mason, I didn't really get it. And then, obviously, as an entered apprentice, I heard it again. And I realized how Masonic the word is. Um, and now in hindsight, I look back at it and like we were talking before the recording, um, you found a reference to the word in the King James Bible. Yeah. So that's a, that was the first reference to it. Um, <clears throat> linguists um, uh, have great respect for the King James Bible. More than that, it's, it's like a Bible to them. <laughs> that and Shakespeare. Um, that's where a lot of our words came from. Um, they were um, crafted in the uh, King James Bible. And I don't know if I read this right, but um, I think it said, this was in um, it, on vocabulary.com. You know me, I like to give citations. Um, and they said, I think they said that it was, um, it was the first use of it in James 1. Uh, oh, really? 21. That's the first and, use of it they can find? Yeah, and it said, and there's a lot of words like that, a lot of words in Shakespeare too. And I think they might've been around the same time. Anyway, this is the quote, James 121, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naught is is and reckon and receive I must have left that word and receive the meekness and something word which is able to save your souls. I sometimes can't read my writing, but filthiness and superfluity and, and several the Merriam Webster dictionary calls it uh, immoderate and especially luxurious. Uh, kind of like a Tesla. He, dri he drives oh, a Tesla. Oh, hey, hey, super fluid. Yeah, like a, sh like a shopaholic is is a super, super fluid person. Yeah. Vocabulary.com said it's uh, so unnecessary that it can be done away with. Um, Charles Stoddard, who apparently walked around, walked around glaciers in 1899, said, um, let's see, for a climb over a gra uh, glaciers, the very thickest shoes are absolutely necessary all else seems su superfluous to me so um got a very negative connotation uh, we a lot of people <laughs> didn't know what it was um until jerry gocher told us and also he told us how to pronounce it and he was right according to these dictionaries um we just kind of glanced over it and we do that 
not just with strange words. We do that with our own words. Um, for instance, brotherhood. You know, we all talk about it. And we think, no, what, what is your definition? Or did I already ask you that? No, you haven't. Okay, what is your definition of brotherhood? Or not definition, but what do you think of it as? Well, the word brotherhood, to me, it's identifying like a group of people that are brothers, um, meaning that you take care of each other. So mm -hmm. a fraternity is a brotherhood in that it's a group of men that treat each other like brothers and that they take care of each other like family. That's what brotherhood means to me. That's good. That's good. Good uh, definition. <clears throat> well, brotherhood, if you dig down a little bit, drill down a little bit into the thought, uh, you'll find areas where you can, where you have an opportunity um, to demonstrate brotherhood. And my big one for the last, I don't know, five years or so uh, has been, you know, we show brotherhood to each other. We need to show brother. We have the opportunity to show brotherhood to the new brothers. Uh, yeah. and to the petitioners and to a, an EA because um, that that's a place where um, it really makes a difference. Um, you know, it's wonderful that, you know, if I see you at a lodge, I'll smile, I'll trade a few words, and um, to me, that's brotherhood. Um, like um, when you say, how, are you, how do you do? Um, Louis Armstrong said, neighbors passing saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. So um, that's a brotherhood that we have, but there's there's a much greater opportunity. I don't want to, um, there's another opportunity that's great. Um, the people, many of them these days who come to our lodge, and you've seen this more than me, uh, you say, why did you come here? And they say, because I don't have any friends. Uh, and I wanted to have some friends. <clears throat> and of course we tell them, I that, you know, that. yeah. Yeah. And honestly, you, that's one of the reasons I joined. Um, yeah. The idea of a fraternal, group which means it's only dudes i didn't have any male friends my really my whole life so i was seeking out like friends like you just said on a certain level that is one of the reasons i joined how do you like them now that you've experienced them <laughs> i've been through a roller coaster on that like i, I in the beginning i just believed everything 100 percent that mm -hmm. i was told um, and then what happens is it's kind of like your first divorce is how I, I, I feel about it. Like when I was married for the first time and I thought divorce was just a thing on TV and movies. Like I didn't think it was real or could happen yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, and when my marriage fell apart, uh, my whole world crashed. Like everything I believed was yeah. I had to question now because yeah. I had believed so much that this was a forever thing. Um, and so joining the lodge, all the tenants of the fraternity, I had the same experience, like an idiot. I just believed everything. I, and I thought everybody would think and act the way that we're told to. And in reality, it's not the case. A lot of people um, don't take it seriously. And um, they just continue to act profane, even though they're Masons. And I had a very uh, radical period of time where I thought it was all made up. Um, and now I've come to a place where I realize, oh, people are just people. Like <laughs> the people that put these, that took the time to think through a system and put it into place, cared about it so passionately that they wanted to transmit it through time. Um, and it's really up to us to keep it alive and going and not let it die because these are important ideals, things we're never going to live up to. You and I or nobody's ever going to live up to these ideals but it's the act of trying that makes us good. So I, I've come to the realization that men are just men, and it doesn't matter if you're in politics or if you're in Freemasonry or, or it's, in, it's in your own home. You'll, you'll love and hate the same person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's just the humanity, the nature of being human. And so what makes us good is that we keep trying to do better. That's, and, that's beautiful. That really is. And this um, fraternity gives us those things to try to be good at, and it gives you a way to do it. And even some exercises and tools and things to visualize and think about, like it really does give us a way to improve ourselves if we're willing to try to do it. It sure and improved it's me. I was, I was, before masonry, I was, I was so obnoxious. I didn't even like having myself around. But um, the one thing you didn't that, like uh, <laughs> no, I, I thought it was okay. But anyway, 
Um, we're really getting into the weeds here. But one thing I wanted to say is that um, there's a movie called The Verdict. And movies have – I'm a lawyer. And they have wonderful closing arguments. You know, they got a team of writers writing them. And the one in The Verdict was especially good. Um, and he started off by talking about um, the Supreme Court building. It says um, – Equality, uh, justice and equality for all. And he asked the jury, he, said, he says, um, is that a description of us? Uh, is that an accurate description of us? Is that a guarantee? And he said, no. And I always get goosebumps when I get to this part. I said, it's a prayer. Yeah. It's a it's prayer a that we'll have equal justice for all. Um, and that's what, um, you know, these, uh, Masonic principles are, um, yeah, know, something we strive for, and Mas Masonry recognizes that and says everywhere yeah. it's not perfection that we're looking for. Right. And um, someone once told me if um, if uh, something if we were all following a rule, you wouldn't need the rule in the first place. The yeah. Rules are there so that we follow them when we weren't going to. Um, yeah. The, that's true. By the way, the verdict is a 1982 American legal drama film, and it starred Paul Newman. Yeah, that's so. just talking to the jury, and it it's great. And he says, he says the, the you know we impanel juries, and the legislature can't affect this, the Supreme Court can't, well they can't, the president can't affect it, the judge can't. And he said, there's only one person that can give um, justice to my to my client, and then he goes. It's you, ladies and gentlemen. And that just oh, the way he says it. Um, it just really, that's a good movie. I recommend it. Um, well, how so, cool is it? Because you're in the legal profession. And um, I feel like the legal system, our American government system, are all fraternal extensions of this fraternity, right? Like this country was founded on the principles of the Masons who built it. And I think the legal system is kind of part of that. And masonry has its own legal system and rules and Masonic digest. And so how do you as a lawyer see, do you see the similarities between the Masonic, like Masonic law digest and our Masonic trial system and the American government system? Or is that something I'm imagining in my head? No, it's, you're right. And it's a huge, it's a huge question. Um, and spare me a little time to say it. Um, there have always been courts, but they weren't always as um, des desirous of, uh, of being fair and uh, yeah. keeping Impartial people free. Justice. Yeah, you know the um, the uh, kangaroo or the uh, courts out in the woods. They call them the um, I forgot. They call them some great, great. Um, it's a great name, but anyway. Um, so this brings up something that is a topic I was going to maybe do if we had time. Um, we, there's things we don't know about masonry, just masons all the time, because you can't. Yes. And right. A lot of it's not in there right. in the books or the lectures. And the books One are thing, really all we have, right? Like there's no oral yeah. tradition outside the books these days. Well, I'm, I think this is an oral tradition. Um, you know, we, we haven't cited the, the uh, books, but just a little while. And this, um, since this is um, laudatory and, you know, a little flowery, what I'm going to say, um, I think it's part of the oral tradition. Um, one of the things that we don't recognize enough or even say enough or even know is that, and I'm not saying this because it's our it's our organization, and yay, our organization. But Freemasonry is one of the noblest institutions in the world and history because of what yeah. I'm going to tell you. It's, um, it's almost a fact. I mean, the word noblest has to be an opinion, opinion but if you know what um, the facts that I'm going to tell you are, are facts. Prior to um, the 1700s, the late 1700s, um, freedom was unknown. You know, we, we take it for granted. I'm not, yeah. We don't take it for granted. We talk about it all the time. The land of the free and the home of the brave. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the guy's name um, who says, I'm proud to be American, or at least I know I'm free. 
Yeah. Um, uh, there's dozens of songs like like that, uh, maybe more. Um, we do appreciate our freedom, but I don't know how much. I don't know if anybody knows except Tomas Zentner, the smartest person I know. Sorry, Chris. Um, he I don't, says I don't that, claim to be smart. It doesn't hurt my feelings. <laughs> And I know um, Tom Tomas is is, yeah. is a genius, so he's we need really to get smart. him on the podcast to talk about the Enlightenment and some of the things he's passionate about because people would yeah. love to hear it. You do because he will rather than me, he'll actually say accurate things. So it's um and he sounds exactly like you would think a vampire should sound like. <laughs> he's mongry. Yeah. Yes, Chris. I right. will do it. Ha ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> we'll right. have him on. You'll see. I'm gonna put Count Count Dracula and him next to each other, voice to voice. You'll be like, I can't deal with it. Yeah, I, th- I, I see him every 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 two weeks. Um, we have a, a, a um, principles philosophy and principles class. Yes. And he's really um into that uh, and very knowledgeable. Uh, but here's what happened. You know, you see TV shows. Um, um, what's that one that was so popular with the blonde-headed girl that everybody was always getting naked and now excited about? So, uh, Game of Thrones. Is that it? Oh, Game of Thrones. Okay. Yeah. You know, that, that if you notice, there's no voting booth there, and there's no yeah. election sign. Yeah. It was kings. Um, and right. And, queen. you know, in um, our fairy tales that we read kids, you know, there's a prince and beautiful and he makes this woman princess you don't yeah. see you don't hear about you know saying you don't hear about that stuff because it didn't exist yeah the idea of people just regular people deciding things for themselves just wasn't yeah. there there were kings and lords um and it was even worse than that because the um people that lived on the on the land were basically slaves um you know they're not in the and you know they weren't chained in the thing that you normally think about as slaves but they were serfs and if you look up serfs and that's with an e if you look up with a u you'll get the beach boy songs um there's nothing wrong with that but this is serfs and um masonry comes from the tradition of um in england there were a couple of uh, revolutions one of them worked and one of them didn't and, uh, the english civil war and the glorious revolution and a lot of people came out of that um, philosophizing and talking about freedom. Um, John is Locke. The, is it, what? The Peasants' Revolution? Is that, what, is that one of them that you're talking about? What's that? I, I remember there was one called the Peasants' Revolution or something like that. Yeah, there were little ones too. Yeah, my favorite one is the first one because of the guy that led it was named Robert the Bruce. I just think that's a great name. I was thinking about calling mine, changing my name to David the Nathan, but um, nice, I have, nice. I haven't. Um, so well, anyway, that would make me like Chris the Burns. So yeah. what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Like I go around burning people, like with the, with my yeah. words, or like with yeah. things? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you were a fire watcher. Your family's were. <laughs> well, Robert the Bruce has um, he has ties to the fraternity. Oh, he does. Like, I didn't know that. If That's you go cool. through the Scottish Rite, the later degrees are all about the Knight of St. Andrews. And supposedly the order of the Knights of St. Andrews was formed under Robert the Bruce in That's Scotland. Great. And and we learned about, Masons learned about, um, you know, people voting and, and um, working together and the power in the people because they were building cathedrals and you yeah, know, you couldn't just ignore a person and put them out there like a machine. They had to be, um, they had to exercise uh, their own judgment. I'm told that on aircraft carriers, the the lowest man in the ship can stop the ship. He can call the admiral really? and say of the ship, and say stop the ship, and um, and he will. That's you guys are in a lot of trouble if you just made it up, but. Um, yeah. But that's that's how that works. You know, if he sees an iceberg or a goldberg or anything like that, um, the um, that's a joke. Well, you need to do that. I mean, I, I right before this podcast, I was in the middle of watching a Netflix documentary, like a nine-part series on the Cold War and the nuclear 
you have having the nuclear weapon and, and its impact on society. And um, I'm only on episode like six, and there's already been three cases where entire annihilation of all life on Earth hinged on one person. Yeah. They're exercising human judgment and not following the system that was set up because the system is set up for war. The system is set up to be aggressive. The system is to either respond or initiate aggression. And the only thing that saved all life on Earth three times so far on this documentary, and you they interview the people, is people saying, let me think about this first. Mm. <laughs> Hold on a second. And those people were right. Um, in one case, a 50-cent electronic piece caused uh, it caused people monitoring the equipment to think there were 2,000 nuclear warheads headed to the United States. God. 50-cent equipment m- malfunctioned, and the people should have done their job and told the president, who would have obviously in- immediately retaliated. And they knew that, and so they didn't. And they waited, and they looked closer, and... Uh, turns out you know they were right but it's a person one person and so you need a system where every single person can you know have an effect on the end result like you just said Mm -hmm. Um, but when you have these uh these military type or or authoritarian type situations where there's a system that funnels everything to one person whose goal is is aggression it's never going to go well for anybody. Yeah. Masonry is a system like that. Yes, we do have a grandmaster, but he doesn't walk around like a dictator. Uh, he yeah. answers to the brothers, right? Yeah. He essentially only has power during the Grand Lodge session, which lasts for three days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and even then, he's just bringing up legislation that's voted on by the brothers in a very yeah. democratic process. So... Freemasonry, it, it, you said it came out of the Enlightenment, which makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Like people mm-hmm. wanted to get away from this authoritarian system, which clearly doesn't work for society. Yeah. And go, go closer to a place where every man's voice should be heard and weighed in order to yeah. have a better outcome for the common good of everybody. And it was, it was so unheard of as to be bizarre. Um, you know, the kings were just the way... You know, they said they got their power from God um, and, yeah. you know, to, to vote on stuff, you know, to ask all the all the serfs and everybody was just a ridiculous thing. It would be like saying to put a dog uh, in charge of the uh, of the presidency of the United States. It was just weird. But Masons wrote about it for years and years. And I don't know if John Locke was a Mason. A lot of people claim him to be. Um, I think John he just Locke. hung out with a lot of Masons. I don't think he was actually a Mason. Um, but um, uh, people like uh, Voltaire and what I told my Mason classes, if you ever want to sound smart, say Voltaire. It just sounds <laughs> intellectual. Doesn't it sound intellectual? It does. It does. Yeah. yeah. I, want, I want to know more about Voltaire. I don't know anything yeah. about it. You, well, you don't need to know about him. You just need to quote him. You just oh, need just to say him. his name. But I actually want to be smart. smart. I don't want to just sound smart. <laughs> That's so sad. How does that happen? Um, he he was um he was a mason and he was oh he uh, was Voltaire yeah yeah very he was a writer, very right? very what's that Voltaire was a writer he was a philosopher and a writer um, a philosopher okay and a big thinker um and he had you know radical radical ideas as well um he was one of the people in the uh, one of the steps along the way that brought us to the um to the 1700s late 1700s where we actually started doing things about it um and you know we we all you know we all are you know very proud of our founding fathers and yes. of the American revolution but that's yeah. another thing we don't realize how monumental that was yeah you know, they we threw off the king nobody had done that uh, no. Oliver Cromwell turned out threw off the king king charles of the i think and but then he became a king, uh, kind of. And some yeah. some lists of the kings of England actually put his name in there as, as one of the kings. Um, so that really didn't have much to do with um, the common man. But um, there is a book. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I thought you were done there. Go ahead. 
Well, I was going to say that um, there's a book, I have forgot the name of, oh, The Cousins Wars. Instead of brothers, you know, the, um, the movements in England, the ones here, were not quite brothers, were cousins. Yeah. And so you know. he said that the, the uh, English Civil War, the American Revolution, and the Civil War were all one war. Um, they were all about the same thing. Um, and that was the common man against the aristocracy. In the Civil War, um, um, I'm from the South, and a lot of us talk about, you know, you know, we, we needed this, we wanted that, but it was really only the aristocracy that pushed for the uh, for the war. First of all, they were the only ones that could vote then, I think. Um, so the people that, you know, in the North who had come over from Ireland and places like that where people were oppressed, they saw it as a, as a common man versus the aristocracy. They looked at the South as an aristocracy. They'd get right off the boat and go um, and go fight. And they came in great numbers. I'm not sure we would have won the war. The North would have won the war without all the Irish that came over. They were um, really? very, they had been very oppressed. They were, you know, very, very motivated to throw off an England. It was like an England to them. Oh, um, yes. Yes. Yeah. And there, there was a lot of support for the American Revolution in England. Uh, people to who, this day, you know, the Irish people are very on the side of the little man, the little country, yeah. the little, the underdog. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. When I, I went to Ireland with my wife a couple of years ago, and they had so many places that they were housing Ukrainian refugees. So Aww. many. Like, and I'm thinking, this mm -hmm. is such a small country. And I'm seeing so many more Ukrainian refugees here than in my home country, which could actually house a whole, a hell of a lot more. Yeah. Um, and when I asked the people, like, why? Because my wife is Ukrainian. So obviously this caught our eye. And my mm -hmm. wife was like, what is up with this? And they said, we, we get there. We, we feel their fate. Like, it's much, yeah. it's much closer in their history to them than it is to us. That yeah. pressure, that, the oppression that they dealt with that, yeah. uh, that they're still holding on to today. And so they have a, an empathy for others that, could, that are in a similar situation. Yeah, the the um the way things that were uh, were um, put together um, didn't end until um, when Clinton was president. He went over there and got them to sign it up. I mean, it was about to happen anyway, but he got to got them to sign it up. Another thing I want to say about the Irish, um, they get around. <laughs> There's a um, one of the great the founding fathers, also a Mason, um, of, of South America, all the countries of South America. Um, well, there were two of them. One was named Simone Bolivar. He was he was a Mason. Uh, the oh, guy I didn't that freed, know that. Yeah, the guy that freed Mexico and Cuba were yeah. uh, Masons. Um, especially in the Western Hemisphere, a lot of the people that um, that uh, brought about freedom, a lot of the He's freedom from Venezuela. people. Were, yeah. What Venezuela yeah. was also Simone Bolivar because he at first um, South America wasn't broken into countries. It was later broken into countries after they had already gained their freedom. So he's the you know founding father of, you know, three quarters of the states there and maybe more. Um, so like one country has it as, as its um its um currency the Bolivar and there's other things, um other people sure. like that. But the the other guy was <laughs> I always think first time I heard it, I, I still laugh at it because it's such a testament to how the Irish went all over the world and did great things. The other guy's name was Bernardo O'Higgins. That was one of the founding fathers of South America, Simon Bolivar and Bernardo O'Higgins. Um, and he was a Mason. So there were- Really? Yeah. And um, actually, um, when I was talking about Vol Voltaire, he was initiated by Jefferson, who was a Mason. Huh. Well, that and, makes sense. He's a French- writer and i'm sure jefferson was he was all about the french for a while there yeah yeah he was an ambassador and, right to france yeah they yeah he was sent over there george washington sent him over there to try to get the french on our side and he did yeah and i think that won the war for us because yeah they had a big fleet and we had no fleet in Britain, yeah and England had a big fleet lafayette lafayette was also um i have that wrong no i don't lafayette was also a mason so jefferson went over to france mason 
talked to another mason there, Lafayette, who was the admiral of all the fleet, got him to bring over, um, or the next thing you know, he brought over the fleet. Uh, England had the biggest fleet probably there ever was. Um, and we would never, you know, they were blockading us. There wasn't anything we could do, but the French, they, uh, they fought them real well and defeated them here and there. And then another, um, Franklin, Franklin went to Germany. I think it was Franklin, Ben Franklin. And he met up with a Mason there named von Steuben. And von Steuben came to America to help out too. And his help was that he organized the uh, army, got them. Um, uh, yes. And um, he helped out uh, Washington's army, right? Yeah, Washington's army. Made him organize, you know, taught yeah. him tactics. So, but now let me back up one more. Do we still have time? Okay. Uh, <laughs> There's no limits on us. We have unlimited time. <laughs> Maybe we can make it a part one and a part two and three and four. Um, Hold on. We have unlimited time. <laughs> <laughs> That's much better than I could be. <laughs> I like that. I like that when you do that. It cracks me up. That's, That's one of those one of those little things about you that endear you to everybody is I'm that maniacal laugh. So um, let me so, ask you, can I, because we, over the yeah. years, you and I have, we go way off the reservation when we talk. Our, our Yeah, we do. Yeah. Normal people would listen to us and think we're insane because we both follow an idea with logical conclusion, wherever that leads. Okay. Yeah. And it can sound ridiculous, but I have been thinking, um, and you kind of alluded to this in the beginning, that humans are tribal it's in our yeah. genetics to be a tribal people. Mm -hmm. I would go further and say that it's in our genetics to be followers. Um, that we probably survived because a strong person led other people. And yeah. uh, there's something in us also to follow people. And um, in order to do that, they can't be normal. You have to lift them up and make them something greater than you in order for you to die for what they're going to tell you to do. Um, yeah. And this is something that we've seen throughout our history forever. As long as we've had recorded history, we always coalesce behind a strong man, right? Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. here comes the enlightenment where you've got educated people saying, wait a second, there's something within each of us important and critical to our survival and we probably won't continue to thrive if we let our genetics and our animal brain follow a strong man for the rest of time. And you look at human history, like we had hunter gatherers, right? For how many hundreds of thousands of years. And then mm -hmm. we had agriculture came onto the scene. Um, and we advanced much more quickly because we had time to think mm -hmm. we weren't always just hand to mouth anymore we were like oh we have like shelter and food and like we can now sit and think and hmm, so yeah. we started this technological um path that you know in the matter of hundreds of years got us to just basic agrarian life to technology and building things and in the last 50 years technology skyrocketed so fast that we've gone yeah. from you know, radio being like the pinnacle, which I think we were both alive for the time when radio was the pinnacle of technology and the, the way yeah. that we communicated mm -hmm. to now we have satellites in orbit that beam signals everywhere on the planet all the time at will. Mm -hmm. And that's only happened in the last 50, 60 years, right? Like yeah. mm -hmm. our, our evolution is speeding up and it's because... Yeah. The further we get away from the poles of nature, which is follow a strong man, um, be afraid of things in the dark, like make up stories for things we can't understand to like, let's, let's really get our heads together. Let's get our shit together. Let's cooperate. Let's like work together truly as a people. We see ourselves skyrocketing in success as a species. So in my mind, we have to get away from the thinking of follow a strong man and we have yeah. to get more into a democratic world, not just country, but world. If we're going to survive, 
as a species yeah. because the technology is advancing too fast. And if we can't get a handle on it, the strong man is going to use the technology in a way that will end all life for all of us. Yeah. Is that, is that crazy thinking? Or is, is no, there something that's, that? that's, um, that's very, very interesting. And it dovetails with so many things that I've read and they're in this overcrowded mind of mine. Um, it dovetails with all of that. Um, the, um, the uh, strong man, you know, we politicians are yeah. bad for that. You know, Putin is a yeah. strong man. He appeals to people's yes. fear, which is a very basic um, yes. uh, part of us. We've got the basic part, which is animalistic and just, you know, you see a bear, you run. You don't think about it. Oh, what's right. that bear doing there? Um, and then you've got the cortex, which um, thinks. Um, and there, I, I read something. This is off beaten track of the beaten track. So I'm just going to go ahead with this. this, and this. The, um, just light that on fire. You don't need that. A lot of the, the people that were serfs, you know how you talk to yourself in your mind? Yeah. Um, and you say, I'm the queen of Sheba. No, you talk to yourself in your mind. And it's you, never um, good for me. It's always like some negative crap I'm feeding myself about. You're stupid. You're dumb. You shouldn't have said that. Like, my voice is really annoying. I don't know about yours. <laughs> Mine is weird. Is it? Mine connects weird things, uh, things That's that awesome. don't have a connection. And they come out as jokes sometimes. But um, one of the things that um, the, the lower mind cannot, it does not have the ability to understand or implement logic. It just yeah. doesn't exist for the lower mind. <clears throat> so, and not that long ago, they started a series of studies that said that when you're talking politics, you're using that lower mind that has yeah. no logic. And you'll see people um, talking, and they'll contradict themselves. Okay. Enlightenment, and I'll, uh, we've, got, we've got to go. Well, I just want to say one thing. The Enlightenment uh, brought rationality into focus, yeah. thinking things through instead right. of um, being an, an animal. And so that's why it was um, so uh, effective and so, so different. And out of the Enlightenment came modern democracy. It came at the same time. It came right along with it. Yeah. That was part of the plan. They said, um, I think it was John Locke that said, um, there's natural law and there's natural rights. Um, and from that, from logic steps, he, he got to the point that we have inalienable rights. Hmm. So that, you know, that came right from masonry. Um, no, you're, so, uh, you're a big, you're obviously, um, very educated person. Like I said, you, you, you got your CPA's license, you're a practicing attorney. These aren't like things the average Joe accomplishes in their life. And you read a lot, you probably always read a lot. And yeah. uh, as a Mason, you've utilized your uh, love for knowledge and you've read a lot of Mackey, Albert Mackey yeah. writings about Freemasonry. How, yeah. how much has that impacted your Masonic life? What you've read from Albert Mackey? I'm glad you, glad you <clears throat> brought that up because, as I said earlier, I I like to make sure that what I'm reading is correct and, you know, scientific and, and that kind of thing. You know, you won't ever see me quoting the Internet. You'll see me quoting the person who wrote the thing on the Internet. And I'll only quote them if I see where they studied, where they got it, and that they're for real. Um, and one of the things that... Um, I was curious because ever since I've known you, you've always referenced Albert Mackey. Oh, so right. I wondered, like, and now I have you on a podcast. I thought it'd be a good opportunity to ask you, like, how much has what you've read about Albert Mackey impacted your life as a Mason in Masonry? Well, the only two, and this was again at the only two writers that I um, know are authoritative are Mackey and um, Albert Pike. Right. Um, I haven't taken the time to find out. I've read a lot of other stuff from people, but I was wondering if anybody listening to the podcast can tell me another um, writer or philosophy of masonry that um, that is considered authoritative, and we can figure out why he's considered authoritative, and I can start quoting him. It's a very funny thing. I'll tell the listeners. Uh, the uh, <laughs> We used to have these kind of um, – discussion groups yeah. like this and Chris and I didn't realize I was doing this I was always citing Mackey everything I yeah. said was Mackey and yeah. maybe one Pike 
And so, um, I busted you your balls said, a little bit about that. Yeah, it was, it was, what's that? I busted your balls a little bit about that. I, yeah. You, yeah. You said, do you have anybody else to cite except Mackie? And I got very defensive because, <laughs> you know, um, first of all, I didn't. And second of all, um, it was, to me, it seemed like that was enough because the guy's very prolific yeah. and you're right. Yeah. He, yeah. He's, a, a, a major world-class mind. So um, yeah. that went on for a long time. And thank you for not, uh, thank you for lightening up on that. But I would like, it's a yeah, very serious question. Something I've been looking for. If anybody knows uh, whether any of the other authors out there are considered authoritative and, and why, um, or authors that I haven't seen, I, I really, great. you know, let's really that. need that. Like if you're, if you're listening to this show, whenever it is, could be a year after this was released and you happen to be listening to it, go ahead and email um, Chris at onthelevelpodcast.com and send yeah. us who you read, who are your Masonic authors that you trust. And we'll put a list up on our website of everyone's favorite Masonic authors uh, for, for you to go get information. And here's the thing about it. This is why I busted your balls about it um not to bust your balls because i what you're doing is the right thing like when i see a lecturer and at the end of his lecture he has citations mm. i respect that lecture so much more than the person yeah. who just says a bunch of sensational things and says thank you have a nice night and walks away like i don't yeah. know what was real and what wasn't real um so the fact that you're citing a person makes makes it much more um authoritative whatever is being talked about and it is good people should do that my problem with it was always this isn't a person who has any authority to speak about Freemasonry any more than you or me. He's just a brother talking about what he thinks about the fraternity. It's not necessarily a Masonic author in the sense of a creator of Freemasonry. This is just a person who's passionate about the fraternity in the same way we are. And so um, I... Blasphemy. Blasphemy. I know, I know. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> But to me, it's like we are all searching for our own answers to this stuff. And if we take Albert Mackey as the definitive source of the meaning of everything in Freemasonry, we might lose some of our required critical thinking process to find our own answer if we just take his answer. Um, but I, I know that's not what you're doing when you cite him. You're actually sparking discussion when you cite Mackey. And this is what Mackey says about it. And then I know this about you and something I greatly appreciate about you. Whenever you're hosting any kind of dialogue, you make sure everybody talks, whether they want to or not. You always look yeah. at them and say, what do you think about that, Chris? And you're yeah. forcing them to think about it. And even yeah. if they don't want to, when you call somebody out, they have to say something. They got to think about it. <laughs> and so you're yeah. kind of forcing them to think about the topic. So mm. don't think mm. that I don't appreciate what you're doing. I just... Um, you know, I just like to bust your balls. That had nothing to do with uh, saying you were wrong for that at all. Well, this, I need to say this. You are right. Quoting one source is not the way things should be done. It should be a lot of sources. Yeah. One of the problems is um, we're just that there are, you know, there's, um, he wrote so much that nobody else yeah. is even close. And, You're right. you know, I don't, I don't, I can only, I only cite him blindly when he hasn't, you know, given the derivation, but he often, you know, takes you through the whole logical steps. Yes. Um, yeah. That um, that lead him to what he says, and that's yeah. another reason that people respect him so. But the, the, you know, it's hard for me to describe the volume of the material, and it's hard for me to describe the um, the support, the great support and thinking that went into that stuff. So, I've never been one to just cite one person, but. Like I say, I can't find any other, and his is just so good. It is you know? good, and it is logical, too. You're right. When you read what Mackie writes about things, you always wind up shaking your head, I think, on, yeah, 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 I guess he's right. I can see that. Let me give you an example. Um, I think I just opened up one of his books, and in there it says, um, Masons revere labor. Yeah. I didn't know that. I never heard of that. And he goes into... All this, you know, and it makes sense once you hear that because we're all about labor, the working tools, and we're building something. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he says we hate permits because they don't make anything. And that's just an example of um, of dozens of things that, um, you know, you'll read something and you look at the bottom and it was written by Albert Mackey. So, 
I don't want to focus too much on him. I want to get some other people. And so if anybody else knows. Yes, send it in. Authoritative writers. Send us your favorite platonic it. writers so that we can publish it and Dave can have new sources to cite. Other Dan than, Brown doesn't count. I don't think Dan Brown is a Mason or was a Mason. Yeah. He just <laughs> uh, he just wrote about things that involve Masonry. Yeah. I, I, um, I had Jeremy Barnes on the podcast, who's the creator of Amity. And uh, yeah, he was the master of the film. Yeah. Do you know Jeremy? No, but I heard the podcast. Okay. Yeah. He actually met, you know, Dan Brown did research in his lodge as, and he wrote the book the year he was the master. Wow. Yeah. And there's a character wow. like whose hand got cut off that could potentially be Jeremy. So it's a, uh, it's a really small world Masonically yeah. in the United States. This is one of the great things about our fraternity is that um, we're supposed to be finding our own answers. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be asking these questions and taking in other sources and deciding for ourselves what's right and wrong. Because it, there is no real dogma to the fraternity that says you must believe this. Really. It, it's more about, like you said, we, we revere labor. So our dogma is more about you must do this. If you want to be a good person, you must do charity. If you want to be a better person, you must help other people. You must listen to other people. You must try to subdue your passions. We're all about like what we should do to become better. That's our dogma is like action. And if you're not doing the work, how are you ever going to become a better person? It takes yeah. effort and labor and work. It's hard work to change negative things about yourself. Really hard work. And it's even I would harder. agree with that fifty. I would agree fifty percent with that. Hey, that's because I think number. there's also a lot to be said for studying. Yeah, because studying can give you ideas, mm. and it can start yeah. taking you. And like when you when you see how somebody interprets something, you can kind of like spark your own ideas about things and say, "Oh, I never thought about that. I never really mm. imagined it. It meant that." And uh, it, it's happened to me many times, and and I we've talked about it like. There's a part of our ritual in the opening and closing of our ceremonies called the battery. And I'm not going to say what it is or when it happens, but you know what I'm talking about when I say it. Yeah. And I came to you and asked, what is this the battery? Not that battery. Oh. There's a really good joke, though. Uh, you know, what did the battery say to the bag of chips? <sighs> if you're ever ready, I'm free to lay. Okay. That has nothing <laughs> to do. <laughs> I just made babies cry. <laughs> oh, don't cry, baby. Don't cry. That's great. That's funny. I love uh, the sound effects. <laughs> where was I going with that? Uh, the battery. Yeah, the battery. Yeah. This is a good example. Um, a couple of us were wondering, what does this really mean? Why do we really do this? And we got some answers that made logical sense. And I think you gave cool. me one, which was, well, there's a number. The number equates to the degree, and this is a signal to us as to which degree we're in, and that's why the battery is important. Logical, mm. makes sense. I get that. Mm. But I was mm. looking for an esoteric answer that I never got. No matter how many people I asked, nobody really had a good esoteric answer for what's the symbolism of it. The logical reason behind it does make sense to me. But everything in Freemasonry has an esoteric meaning, too. So... I, just, I have my opinion on that. My opinion is it means sit down and shut up. <laughs> but, you know what? But nobody does sit down when they do the battery in the opening and closing ceremony. It's like not related. Yeah. Is it? No, it's not. Everybody's mm -hmm. already standing when they do that. Is, so, it to, is it to break the um, the bad things off of you to make your stone smooth? That's, that's you know, how I take it, honestly. And so... Yeah. Um, in my research, which was just asking people, I kind mm -hmm. of understood the logical reasoning for it, and I get it, but um, that symbolic meaning and esoteric meaning I had to come up with on my own, and I did adopt mm -hmm. it, and it's forever going to be a part of who I am as a mason now. Whenever I go to an opening or closing of a lodge, I, I close my eyes and I force myself to imagine those rough hearts breaking off when I hear that, and more... Mm -hmm for one degree than another because you need it more in that degree than the other. Uh, yeah. 
when you're got when you're about to go into a full business meeting, you better you better be preparing yourself to yeah you know be right. a vessel for what do we call it uninterested um, brotherly love like we're not passionate un uninterested. There's there's a word they use hmm. for I that. I don't know that word. No. Nope. Uh, but I think that like that's uh, well, that's one of the great things about our fraternity is that you can pull those little things out of it for yourself that nobody but you might believe. But yeah. it, it it's not wrong if it's making you better. It's right for yeah. you. And yeah. that's kind of a beautiful thing about Freemasonry is that we can we're all having our own individual experiences, even though we're doing it together. Well. I talk out of both sides of my mouth because I say that, um, you know, young people uh, need to learn stuff, learn it all before, you know, go through the steps before they start giving their interpretations to it. But by the same token, there's something in the um, uh, the uh, one of the rituals, I won't say which, it talks about good and evil. And I changed it. <laughs> I just felt like changing it. I changed it to good and bad. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're having a good day. You know, there'll be a bad one. You're having a bad day. It'll, you'll have a good one. And um, I was not authorized to do it. It's not <laughs> right. And um, I have no excuse for it. And, um, you know, but let me you have it. Those well, are themes in the fraternity, right? The light and the dark, the good and the bad. Those are definite themes in the fraternity. Yeah. So you're not wrong in talking about it that like, like that. Because the fact well, that, that is that simple, man. <laughs> No, it was definitely about good and evil and how I think what you're talking about is where it's trying to tell us that inside of men, all men are good and evil. Like oh, nobody's that's... pure. Nobody's pure evil. Nobody's pure good. We all have both inside of us. Well, again, you, you taught me something and that's just as mine is that, you know, if you're having a, you know, if everything's going badly, people, people say, uh, oh, I'm just a, jerk everything everything's going to go bad or yeah you know, it's never going to stop but then there's a great good then there's a good part and the same thing with the good everything's going well you know be prepared because you know a hurricane might hit you actually i've i've used your explanation of that to other people i have you i and i know you wouldn't be mad about that but no, the very not. same explanation you used i've given it to to people so because it does make sense to me it does actually help people. I think mm -hmm. it can help people to start looking at it that way. Like when the sun's shining, you better start planning for the darkness because that sun ain't going to stay out forever. And when yeah. you're fumbling alone in the dark, don't think it goes on for eternity. It's going to end. You'll find the light again. And so yeah. don't get lost in the darkness. Like keep moving forward. Like, hey, man, those are good lessons for people. I think I could just say, that reminds me of another thought instead of just saying that's what it stands for. Yeah. yeah. So you say I'm yeah, smart. Yeah. I'm not I just thought of that now. Like um, even on this podcast, um, because uh, I talk a lot, people think I'm trying to be authoritative. So I have to repeatedly say, and again, I'm not trying to teach anybody here. I'm just telling you one man's perspective on this thing we're talking about. I can't speak for the whole fraternity. Other than when I'm citing stuff out of here. That's the only time I'm speaking to the fraternity. Talking things out really does help. I mean, yeah. when, when I have like anxiety about something, mm -hmm. I notice like when that, because my voice is evil, like I said, it's always feeding me negativity. So if I'm left to my own devices, I get darker and darker in the places that I'm thinking about. So for me, it's really helpful to talk about things. Because people, other people have way more positive outlooks on things than I do. And I can be like, oh, okay, I can see that, you know, and I could take some of their positivity into myself. I, but I need to talk about it with people or else I'm going to be a depressive person. Yeah. Well, That's probably part um, of our like tribal need. Well, I'm, like I told you, I make those crazy connections. So I must have been the medicine man in the uh, in evolution <laughs> or the, or the or the village idiot or something. I can totally see you with those big gauge holes in your ears and like <laughs> a, a bone in your nose, maybe. Yeah. And some paint on your yeah. face. Yeah, I could totally see yeah. that. Because you'd be um, stylish, man. <laughs> I'll have to give you some of those. I wish I had some 
some examples because they're really weird. Like um of your medicine man thinking? Of my connections. Oh, the weird connections. connections you made. Can you remember any of them? Sheesh, we've talked a lot about space and the universe and the meaning of life and time and uh we've talked a lot about well, psychology. About the... Actually, well here's one. Here's that's what you one. gave me. Um REM sleep. When your eyes what? are going, when you reach that rapid eye movement part of your sleep, that's yeah. like when you're having the most productive sleep. And yeah. I've always known that, but you told me, oh, hey, modern psychology has this thinking that if you can reproduce that eye movement, you can process it in your waking mind. Yeah. So that my boss, my boss also told me, he said, you know, when you're happy, you smile. It also goes the other way around. So if you're not happy, if you smile, it'll make you happier. Um, and I'd like you to do some research on that, if you don't mind. The the physical act of smiling making you emotionally feel better. Yeah, like when so when you when you you're happy, you smile, and yeah. it works the other way around. When you smile, it, you become happy. It's true. It's so primal. I saw a uh, go 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 look on YouTube for a clip of this like really old gorilla. And uh, this gorilla is dying and almost doesn't really interact with the world at all anymore because the gorilla is so old and dying. But um, mm -hmm. the man who actually taught that gorilla as, as a baby sign language and stuff came to see it on his deathbed. And that gorilla's face lit up with uh -huh. the most heartfelt smile and joy that you uh -huh. can imagine. And you're like, yeah. wow, this is definitely something like primal within us, that smiling reflecting our happiness so uh, I, I know you're right about that there's definitely a physical connection to the emotional happiness yeah, yeah. and uh maybe maybe if you can fake you got to fake it till you make it isn't that what that's, a, that's exactly what that means <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. if you're not feeling happy yeah. just smile you'll get there yeah and I'm, I'm jewish and a rabbi once told me he says you know if you're we told everybody it was a sermon he said if you if you're not sure um you believe in God, you know, go through, go to services and go through everything anyway. And you'll eventually you will. Yeah. You know, it goes both ways. If you believe in God, you'll go to the services. If you go to the services, it can help you believe in God. So, well, we have covered brotherly love, brotherhood. We've talked about the superfluities of life and what that means to <laughs> us as Masons. We've talked about uh, doing our passions as well as a lot of other crazy things on this short podcast. Um, yeah. This podcast is by no means a huge deal uh, but it does get out there so you're 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 potentially now and in the future going to be heard by a lot of people that are masons all over the world and maybe by some people that aren't masons and so i always like to leave every podcast by giving our guests the opportunity to speak to those people directly so um as we leave worshipful david finkelstein on the way out uh, what would you say to those masons listening today um, I would say, don't leave your new Masons in the dark. <clears throat> um, show them brotherhood. The brotherhood, you know, they're Masons. An EA is a Mason. And um, you want to show him brotherhood. And the way to show him brotherhood is to be his friend. Don't leave him, you know, sitting in the, in the dark for a month until you hear from, uh, you hear from us, you know, Call, call him, take him to lunch, uh, go bowling, uh, ball game. You know, show brotherhood to the new brothers. I love it. It's never too soon to start showing that you care about somebody once they join the fraternity. They need it. That being said, um, for On The Level Podcast, we appreciate worshipful David Finkelstein. Uh, Thank Liberty you. Lodge and plural member at Sarasota Lodge, number 147, my home lodge. Woo, woo. And there you go. Uh, I hope I hope you come back. I hope I didn't scare you away. Um, love to have you back <laughs> on the show to talk more. All right, thank you. All right. Okay, <laughs> thank right. you. That's it for us on the right, podcast. We're out. <laughs>